I've been asked to talk about what a climate adapted coastal community looks like in 2030. And I admit here, I am not an expert in this subject. So why I was asked to talk about this, I don't know. But when Gene asks you to do things, you tend to say yes. And then later, you, you, you regret it, um, which I am right now. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this anyway. And so what, in some ways, coastal communities are unique. Everybody thinks about coastal communities being unique. You know, um, Mount Buller isn't susceptible to sea level rise. You know, so um, sea level communi uh, coastal communities have some unique features. But in other ways, they're just communities like any other community. Um, they are specific to where they are. They have different. They're dependent on different agriculture. They're dependent on different. Uh, things within the society to make them function. They are big, they're small, they're on cliff tops, they're at sea level, they you know, they're, they depend on tourism or they depend on agriculture. They're all different. So just as every community com is different, every coastal community is also different. So when you start talking about the vulnerability of coastal communities, you can start to look at some of the things that maybe they do have in common and things like, yes, well, Sea level rise, obviously, storm surge, and so on. But some are vulnerable to bushfires, because many of them are also in bushfire-prone regions. When you think about susceptibility to heat stress, maybe coastal areas are less susceptible than other areas, because they, of course, have the sea breeze, which will help to ameliorate some of the warming. But then that also brings perhaps other problems. Perhaps people in the cities will also realize the coastal areas are quite nice in terms of not having the kind of heat stress that they'll be facing in the city. So perhaps all the people from the cities will head to the coast. And what, what challenges does that present? Some of these towns and villages are, are uh, based on tourism. Some are not. Uh, but how is tourism going to develop under a climate community, uh, under a new climate change? Um, so as with all adaptation, it depends where you are. And that's true for coastal communities as well. And uh, that's really all I've got to say. But of course, I've only used up about two minutes. And so I'm going to, I'm going to talk for another 13 minutes anyway. Um, and I'm going to cover five aspects of what a climate adapted community should look like in 2030. Um, and that's about how they can reduce their vulnerability, how they can reduce their exposure to hazards, and how they can look at pooling or transferring the risks that they bear, how that they can prepare and respond to the climate challenges that they have, and how they can prepare themselves for the things that they can't prepare for, the surprises. So the first one of those is, is in terms of reducing vulnerability. The first thing that all adaptation starts with is figure out how vulnerable you are, figure out what you're vulnerable to, and then make yourself less vulnerable. Um, that's really... <laughs> Yeah, it's easy to say, isn't it? <laughs> but how do you do that? Um, what does a community need to do to reduce its vulnerability? Well, the first thing is it needs to be a community. Um, if it's just a collection of people living in one place, it's very hard to reduce your vulnerability. If you're a community which shares, has good decision, local decision-making processes, um, has a People, where people support each other through crises, where there's good family structures, good local transport, good local government decision making, all of those things, you've got the basis of a community. And you've got community leaders who, who will lead and bring community together. So for a community to, to reduce its vulnerability, the first thing you need is a community. And how do you develop a community? Well, it kind of helps if, if you have some degree of prosperity. It's much easier to adapt to climate change, to build defensive infrastructure or whatever, if you actually have a little bit of money to do that. So having a prosperous community is important in terms of being able to adapt. Having a healthy community is important. So having clean air to breathe, having clean water to drink, um, having good access to health services, that's going to be an increasing challenge by 2030. Um, in 1950, there were 12 people of working age to support every person over the age of 60 in Australia. 
By 2009, that had reduced to nine people. By 2050, that's going to be four people. So I don't know which four of you are going to put your hands up to support me. Um, but I don't really care which four of you it is, but you know, for every four people that are working, you're going to have to support one person over the age of 60. So a good, healthy community is important and really challenging. A community that has good infrastructure so that people do have comfortable homes that are, have good thermal properties to um, help them in times of heat stress. People that, you know, in, in cyclone prone areas that are resistant to those. Even in places where you wouldn't think of people being vulnerable, you know, that, that you know, vulnerability to hailstones, you know, that the roof tiles don't fall off when the hailstones come. You know, so having good infrastructure in place. And so, and then, you know, as I said, good decision making, good local government, good community decision making, good um, decision making at all levels of government, and having the community feel that they're a part of that decision making. So when I thought about that, it really sums up, you can sum it up by saying what you really need is a healthy, wealthy, and wise community. Um, and that made me think about something my mum used to say. Um, Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. So perhaps all we need is for the men to go to bed early and get up early, <laughs> and we'll be fine. Um, maybe the women can have a lie in, I don't know. Um, so that brings to the second point, which is to either reduce the hazards that you're exposed to, or to reduce your exposure to those hazards. Well, we've all had a go at reducing the hazards. The hazard is climate change, and, and that's mitigation, and that's not what we're here to talk about. So I'm going to put that into the too hard basket for now, just like all the governments have done. And um, I'll talk about how you reduce your exposure to hazards. And first of all, you need to be able to manage risk. So good risk management, working effectively uh, with communities working to, to look at their risks, manage their risks, Obviously, you need good infrastructure. For good infrastructure, you need good regulation. You need good building codes. You need cyclone shelters. Uh, you need all of those things. And for that, um, yes, regulation does have a role to play. Um, we put, you know, the word government has the word govern in it for a reason. Uh, it's there because it's there to govern. It's there to do the things that are the right things to do um, even though it may not be that popular to do it, to have a long-term view, to um, make the hard choices that people perhaps wouldn't make of their own accord. So government and governing has a really important role. We need good land use planning. Yes, all right, you know, maybe that piece of land isn't going to go underwater for the next 30 or 40 years, but it is going to go underwater, so don't build there. Um, or build there properly with good planning regulations. Um, you know, use the science that's there. We had a, a really interesting debate which Kate shared of should science be at the center of decision making? And we all came to violent agreement in the end um, that science has an important role to play. It's, it's an important part of, it is central to, but not exclusive to decision making. And so use the science that's there. We know what to do. We can build houses that are cyclone proof. We can build houses that are able to be secure against floods where all of the essential services are able to be provided. You know, all we need to do is do it. It's not a case of not knowing what to do. It's a case of having the political, social will to do it. We need good catchment and ecosystem management. This is really hard to value. And we had another really good session in this conference about valuation of, of ecosystem services. And you know, it's very hard to put a, a value on biodiversity. It's very hard to put a value on, on forests and ecosystems. People are now starting to do that um, you know, quite effectively. But it's almost the wrong question. Why should we fit that into the economic paradigm? Um, we know that you know, these things are good. We know that the natural environment is important for health, for well-being, for our mental well-being, um, and for our, for our connection to land. I mean, if I've learned anything from, from the work I've been doing with the Yorta Yorta, that connection to land is so important. And, you know, we need 
individuals who are both willing and empowered to act. So when I say governments are there to govern, they're also there to get out of the way and let people do the right thing when they're able to do it for themselves. So we re need resilient systems. So in terms of reducing our exposure to hazards, we know the things we need to do. And, and then at some point, once we've looked at our vulnerability, we've figured out what we're vulnerable to, we've reduced our vulnerability where we are, we've looked at our exposure to hazards and we've reduced them. At some point, you can't go any further. And you have to say, well, there are still some risk there and we're just gonna accept that. And so and then what do you do once you accept that risk? Well, there are still things that you can do. The first one is to, to pool or transfer or share those risks. And when people think of that, they think about insurance. And I learned something really important at this conference. Well, I thought it was important anyway. Uh, a while ago, I thought, when we talked about climate change, we thought the insurance community was going to be the most vulnerable to climate change because well, we're gonna get more extreme weather events and they're gonna to have to be you know, paying out more premiums. That was very naive of us. Yeah. How did we not figure out that they would just put their premiums up or, or, or refuse to insure people? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so then we thought, all right, well, we got that wrong. So where does the risk lie? Well, the risk lies then with government, doesn't it? As the insurer of last resort was the term we came up with. Um, you know, because when a disaster happens, it's got to be fixed, and so the government has to pitch in. That was really naive as well, wasn't it? <laughs> because... You know, as we found with the Queensland floods, what does the government do? Well, we just, oh, let's have a flood levy. Uh, because we don't want to bear that risk, so all of you can bear that risk. Um, and so, eventually, the risk comes back down to all of us. So that risk is shared by all of us. But the really important thing I learned at this um, conference from the, uh, from the insurance industry presentation was that actually, no, they really are vulnerable because if they have to put up their premiums to the point where people can't afford them, or they're refusing to insure people, actually that is their business to insure people. So if, they're not, if nobody's buying their insurance, they're stuffed. So it's in their long-term interest to provide affordable insurance for people. And so it's in their interest to make sure that we are able to pool and transfer and share those risks adequately. So that was something important that I thought I learned from this conference. And there are other ways of sharing risks. We're working with a, a small coastal community down in Gippsland. And there's a small part of that community which is actually on a quite high level uh, area of land, so they're quite confident that they're not vulnerable to flooding. However, the area around and the area between them and the main town is, and has already been flooded several times, and they've been cut off for several days on a number of occasions. So they thought about, all of, you know, how, about how this was a problem for them, and they came up with a very innovative solution they pulled their resources and bought a boat. <laughs> so now when they're cut off, they can all just get in the boat and go across to the town, buy what they need and come back. So you, you don't have to just use insurance companies to pool and share your risk. You can pool your share and risk in many ways. The next way is to prepare and respond effectively. When those disasters happen, we need the systems in place. And this is where adaptation and emergency management really come together and hit the road together. Um, by early warning and communications, through evacuation plans, through relief supplies, knowing where they're going to come from, how they're going to be provided. And then once a disaster has happened, in terms of post-disaster recovery and support and how people are going to be um, and able, you know, how people are going to be supported through the recovery process, both physically in terms of maybe rebuilding their house, but also mentally and socially, how they're going to be supported. And importantly, to then learn the lessons from that and not just build what was there before in the same way that it was before so that it will happen again, but to actually use adaptation, as John said, as a process by which we then move forward. And finally, the capacity to deal with surprises. Because even when we've done all of that, as we know from climate change, we know we need to expect the unexpected. And this is where we get into the Donald Rumsfeld territory. And I know he got hammered for, for it, but I thought it was really smart. You know, the fact that we're talking about the known knowns, the known unknowns, but of course there will be the unknown unknowns, the things we don't even know we don't know yet. Um, and when those things happen, communities, how do communities prepare for those? Well, the only way you can prepare for those is, for, for, is to be able to have good decision making in place, have a good community, have flexible decision making, have systems that adapt over time, have good knowledge, good skills, build the capacity within community and, and within 
within the communities. And if we do all of that, I think we'll be in pretty good shape in terms of a climate adapted community for 2030. And you're gonna expect me to stop there as well, but I'm not. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna go on for very long. How long have I got? Finished. Hmm? I'm done, am I? Yeah, you're done. All oh, right, okay, then I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm? Am I? Am I? I'm, I'm done, am I? Okay, I'll well, stop there. Thanks. <laughs>